Uh, my name is Bill Hartung, and I run the Arms and Security Initiative here at the New America Foundation. Uh, we're doing a panel today, uh, What Price Nukes, the Hidden Costs of Our Nuclear Arsenal. Uh, so I'm always amazed how many people are willing to come out in the morning to hear about such a cheery topic. Um, and I'll say a couple things, uh, and then we'll get started. Uh, we have with us uh, Stephen Schwartz, who's the author of a wonderful new report on this subject, and uh, Joe Srincioni, the president of the Plowshares Fund. I'll tell you a little more about each of them before they speak. Um, there's a couple things uh, I wanted to mention. Uh, first of all, I, I think the discussion, there'll be a couple aspects. One is just budgetary. How much are we spending on nuclear weapons and related uh, initiatives? Uh, I think the second is, how does that budget break down? How we, you know, how much do we spend on locking down nuclear weapons versus, for example, building and operating them? Uh, and then the third is, you know, how much do we really need? Uh, if I had seen Stephen's report sooner, I probably would have called this event uh, $52 billion a year on nuclear weapons. Are we getting our money's worth? Um, and that would involve, of course, money's worth in terms of security. Um, we're in a new climate. I think Joe will talk about this, but uh, Secretary of State uh, designate uh, Hillary Clinton endorsed a lot of uh, forward-looking initiatives on nuclear reductions in her testimony yesterday. Uh, the incoming uh, head of the Department of Energy, which uh, oversees uh, nuclear weapons production, it's really more of their budget than they spend on energy. It should probably be called the Department of Nuclear Weapons with some energy. Um, uh, he also uh, endorsed the um, the, the vision of a world without nuclear weapons, which I, I don't know if anybody who's run that agency before who has uh, made that kind of commitment in their confirmation hearings. Uh, so let me tell you a brief bit about Stephen, and then we'll get started. Um, uh, Stephen is, uh, from my perspective, the reigning expert on this subject, having um, edited and organized the classic book on the topic, uh, Atomic Audit, uh, which he did in the 90s when he was guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. I meant to bring my sort of well-thumbed copy and wave it at you, but uh, my suitcase got too full, so I couldn't do that. Uh, also, it's a, it's a hefty volume. Um, he has also been a uh, uh, publisher of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Uh, he's now at the Monterey Institute for International Studies and the editor of Nonproliferation Review. Uh, there's many other things I could say about him, but I'm kind of anxious to see his presentation. So. Uh, we'll start with Stephen, then I'll tell you a little bit about Joe before he speaks, and then we'll open it to the floor. Okay, thanks for coming. Great. Well, thank you, Bill. Good morning. Uh, I'm impressed, too, that so many people showed up and you didn't even offer breakfast. So this is, uh, I don't know, I guess, uh, I guess uh, you know, the fact that uh, we're dealing with a financial bailout and Bernie Madoff, you know, money is on people's minds, and uh, money and nuclear weapons is a pretty sexy topic. So, um, normally, uh, when I've been giving this, I've been doing sort of a dog and nuclear pony show this week, and uh, my colleague and co-author Deep Chuba usually starts by talking about the methodology and how we did all this. I'm not going to, I'll spare you all the details. It's spelled out in the beginning of the report. Uh, but basically, um, uh, the folks at Carnegie came to me and said, we're thinking about doing a project trying to figure out what we're currently spending on all things relating to nuclear weapons. Can we do it? And we assembled a very capable advisory committee that's listed in the front of the, of the report and determined fairly quickly that we could, although there were some caveats there, and I'll get into those in a few minutes. Um, so let me just pull this away here, actually, since we've got this set up. Um, and uh, for those of you that may be watching later on the internet, uh, this whole presentation is available at the Carnegie Endowment website at carnegieendowment.org slash nuclear security budget, which is where you'll also find electronic copies of the report and media coverage and everything else um, related to what we've been doing uh, over the last week or so. Um, so let me just start out by saying that although the United States does not maintain or track a nuclear weapons budget per se, it is possible using publicly available government documents to assemble a reasonably accurate, although not comprehensive, and I must stress that, uh, picture of most nuclear weapons and weapons related spending. To assess such expenditures, our report allocates them to one of five categories. The first is nuclear forces and operational support. 
These are costs associated with upgrading, operating, and maintaining nuclear delivery systems, warheads and bombs, and associated infrastructure. The second is deferred environmental and health costs, which are associated with managing and cleaning up radioactive and toxic wastes resulting from and compensating victims of more than 60 years of nuclear weapons production and testing activities. The third is missile defense, costs associated with developing and deploying missile defenses against short and long-range ballistic missiles. The fourth category is nuclear threat reduction, and these are costs associated with reducing and preventing nuclear threats at home and abroad by taking steps to secure nuclear weapons and weapons-related materials, uh, primarily highly enriched uranium and plutonium, and eliminate weapons and weapons-related materials and stem the further proliferation of weapons materials and the technical knowledge to make them. And last but not least is nuclear incident management, and these are the costs associated with preparing for the use of nuclear or radiological weapons against the United States, including continuity of operations programs, <clears throat> efforts to detect and defuse terrorist weapons, technology to trace the source of radioactive materials used in such weapons, otherwise known as forensics, and medical and other response programs to deal with the aftermath of attacks. Now, I should say we created these categories in order to try to step away from the Cold War era terminology with which we usually discuss all of these things because obviously we were 17 years away from the end of the Cold War and we thought it was time to find a new way of, of considering and viewing these issues. Now in some cases you may be thinking to yourself, uh, a program may belong to more than one category and this is true. And in these instances we made a judgment call and assigned it to what we thought was the most logical category. Others may disagree with that choice, and that's why we have made the entire spreadsheet that we use to compile all of this data available on the website for download so that you can see exactly what we did and how we did it and play around with the numbers and add and subtract things yourself uh, if you would like to come up with uh, different figures or do a competing analysis. Um, total appropriations for nuclear weapons and weapons-related spending in fiscal 2008 were at least 52 point four billion dollars according to the best available data. This does not include costs for air defense, anti-submarine warfare, classified programs, and most nuclear weapons related intelligence programs. The total costs borne by the Department of Defense to deploy and maintain nuclear forces are partially estimated and therefore may be too low. Even so, this amount, and it's not just this amount here, it's just a slice of that pie, this amount is far larger than most executive and legislative branch officials would acknowledge. When these officials consider nuclear security costs, they generally do so only from the perspective of their respective department, agency, or jurisdiction. This report can only provide tentative answers, not the answers, to the critical questions of what nuclear security costs for three primary reasons. First, because some programs related to nuclear weapons and nearly all programs pertaining to intelligence-related matters are classified, their specific budgets are unavailable to those without a specific need to know, and that would include, unfortunately, us. Second, a number of other programs relating to the operation of nuclear forces also support conventional missions, for example, dual-capable bomber uh, programs and ground-based and satellite communication networks. And there was no easy way to disaggregate nuclear from non-nuclear costs, particularly because the Defense Department does not do so when preparing its budgets or tracking expenses. The same problem applies to certain programs aimed at preparing for and addressing the consequences of a nuclear or radiological attack because disaster preparedness can and does encompass a wide variety of incident scenarios. And third, the missions of some programs, notably air defense and anti-submarine warfare, have evolved over time, certainly since the Cold War, and uh, most of these programs now are no longer directly related to uh, dealing with or defending against a nuclear attack. Determining how much the DOD spends in these areas is impossible without access to information about specific DOD mission plans and line item budgets, information which is inaccessible to us, is always inaccessible to the public, and is not even widely shared within the government. And I would note that, that even the DOD would likely find it difficult to, an attribute, to attribute an appropriate share of total air defense and anti-submarine warfare spending today to the nuclear side of the budget because many expenses in these areas would be incurred whether or not a nuclear mission was involved. Accordingly, we have excluded them from consideration in our analysis. 
This means that the category totals and the overall totals presented in this report are most accurately viewed as the minimum annual expenditures for nuclear weapons and weapons related programs as a floor rather than a ceiling. No one should leave here today thinking that the United States spent only $52.4 billion on nuclear security last year. The best we can say at this time is that the United States spent at least $52.4 billion or a minimum of $52.4 billion on nuclear weapons and weapons related programs. And as I'll explain a little later, uh, there's good reasons to suspect that the number is significantly higher. By way of comparison, the 2008 nuclear security budget uh, exceeds all anticipated government expenditures on international diplomacy and foreign assistance, which was $39.5 billion last year and natural resources in the environment, which is $33 billion. It is nearly double the $27.4 billion uh, for general science, space, and technology, and it's almost 14 times what the Department of Energy has allocated for all energy-related research and development. Moreover, the allocation of funds among the five categories reveals troubling realities about current government priorities in the nuclear realm. So here we see the breakdown of, uh, of costs. And uh, again, just across the five categories, and I'd be happy to answer questions about this after we're, after we're concluding. Uh, again, this important caveat that we're not including some potentially large expenditures over here. And I would note, uh, well, actually, let me get into that in a second. So what are some additional findings that we have? First, that uh, nuclear weapons and weapons-related spending accounts for about 67% of the Department of Energy budget. 8.5% of the FBI budget, 7.1% of the Department of Defense budget, excluding the supplemental costs of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And if you add the defense portion of the Department of Energy to DOD, you get about 10% of the 050 account, which is national defense, and 1.7% or at least 1.7% of the Department of Homeland Security budget. Now, another way to break this down, perhaps a more useful way, is to look at spending by agency. Um, and I will just caveat this chart by noting that despite the advances in graphics by, made possible by Apple uh, Computer, uh, the, it's not possible to display all the figures on this chart because it would be a muddy mess. But the, all the numbers are available in the printed version on page 8. So again, breaking down by category, but this time looking at agency, first we have nuclear forces and operational support which are the exclusive domain of the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy, with the exception of a $16 million uh, charge to the Department of Interior for leasing Kwajalein Atoll for missile testing and a small amount of money for the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. Uh, then we have deferred environmental and health costs. And what's significant here is that this is pretty much equal to what uh, the Department of Energy is spending on its nuclear weapons programs. Uh, and it's likely to remain at that level or higher uh, for the foreseeable future. Again, these are just the major agencies. If you want to see all the different spending by all the agencies, please look, uh, and I think it's table 9 or 10 in the appendix. Actually, no, it's probably 7 or 8 in the appendix. Then we have missile defense, which is exclusively a defense department program right now. Uh, there are some programs that others count as being part of missile defense that we did not count. Joe may get into that. Uh, we can talk about that later. Um, then there's nuclear threat reduction. And last but not least is nuclear incident management. We'll talk about some of the conclusions we drew, but I'll let you draw your own conclusions from this chart. So here again is nuclear forces and operational support, $29.1 uh, billion. That's about 55% of the total nuclear security budget. Uh, and uh, DOD is responsible for three quarters of this amount. These costs will increase significantly if the Department of Energy's proposals to rebuild the nuclear weapons production complex and resume the production of nuclear weapons are approved and funded. Now, you may be wondering, so how does this compare to things historically? And I can provide a partial answer to that. Uh, during the Cold War, 1948 to 1991, the Atomic Energy Commission and subsequently the Department of Energy uh, expended for what used to be called nuclear weapons research, development, testing, and production about $4.7 billion a year on average during that period. And it's worth noting, of course, that during most of that time, the AAC and DOE were manufacturing large numbers of nuclear weapons and conducting numerous full-scale nuclear weapons tests. And yet today, we're almost at $6.6 .6 billion for the stockpile stewardship program. There's some reasons why we're there. 
Uh, I'm not necessarily going to denigrate stockpile stewardship, but it's remarkable to me, it remains remarkable more than 10 years after we published our book, that it costs more for the Department of Defense not to build and test nuclear weapons. Uh, it's also worth noting that the overall estimated cost of upgrading, operating, and maintaining the nuclear arsenal historically uh, were about 124 to 151 billion dollars a year on average during the Cold War. So again, we've come down significantly, obviously, in terms of costs and in terms of numbers. Uh, many of you probably believe that we have uh, quite a more ways to go. Uh, so what are we getting for this money? Uh, this is just a quick chart showing you where things have been historically with the uh, strategic nuclear arsenal. So we've got bombers, we've got ICBMs, and we've got submarine launched ballistic missiles. And just for those of you that are of historical bent, this is the bomber gap, which is really not much of a gap. If I threw the Russian numbers in there, you would see that. And the missile gap is here. Again, there really was uh, no gap, at least nothing that uh, would have um, harmed U.S. security. And uh, then we take a look at the U.S. nuclear weapons inventory. This is the total number of weapons in the stockpile, uh, not the total number of deployed weapons. Total deployed weapons are listed on top there. This shows everything uh, because uh, most of the weapons that have been retired uh, during the last eight to ten years have not been dismantled yet. They are in storage awaiting disposition. We haven't decided what to do with them yet. And as they sit there waiting, they incur substantial costs for security uh, and, and other programs. So the next slice of the budget is deferred environmental and health costs. This accounts for 15.8% of the budget, $8.3 billion. Uh, again, to deal with uh, more than six day, decades of nuclear weapons production and testing activities. 75% of the costs in this category, $6.2 billion, go toward the Department of Energy's Environmental Management Program. Because these costs are largely but not entirely associated with historical activities, they are loosely connected to the cost of sustaining the current arsenal. However, if nuclear weapons production resumes, or if the Department of Energy moves forward with plans to decommission many older production sites, these costs will increase in the future. And here I would just note or pull out something that we have in the report. At the Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory alone, they have plans to decommission some 400 formerly used facilities, uh, which is going to cost something like 9 to $14 billion uh, over the next uh, 5 to 10 years. That's at one site alone. We've got many of these sites around the country, all of them with many individual facilities. So even if we decide to reduce numbers dramatically, we're going to be paying for this uh, for, for many, many years to come. And then for those of you that are not up with current nuclear lingo, let me just define a few of these terms under the victim compensation category. NTPR is a nuclear test personnel review program. This is run by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency to identify veterans who uh, may have participated in nuclear weapons tests so that they can receive compensation if they were uh, harmed by exposure to radiation from such testing. Uh, RECP is the Radiation Exposure Compensation Program run by the Justice Department, uh, initiated in the 1990s to compensate civilians who were harmed by atmospheric nuclear testing activities. Uh, and EEOICPA is the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act, which was also established in the 1990s to compensate workers at Department of Energy nuclear weapons facilities who were exposed to radioactive or toxic, toxic substances on the job. It's a trust fund program, so it's largely not in the budget. Uh, we do discuss it in the section of the report dealing uh, with this, and if you have questions about it, I can get into it later. Uh, next up is missile defense. Uh, accounts for 17.5% of the nuclear security budget, $9.2 billion. This is almost exclusively the Missile Defense Agency's budget, uh, but there are some other programs out there, as Joe will talk about, uh, that are not properly or formally part of missile defense. Uh, this amount of money is 56% more than the amount allocated for all nuclear threat reduction programs. More than 46% of the missile defense budget in fiscal 2008 went toward the National Missile Defense Program deploying components of a land-based anti-missile system in Poland and the Czech Republic, as proposed by the Bush administration, would push these costs higher in future years. And note, as we note on the chart, that this does not include operation and, uh, and maintenance costs for the Patriot and SM-3 anti-missile systems that are located in the Army 
and Navy operations and maintenance budgets, respectively. I would also note, just regard, with regard to this yellow slice here that's NMD and TMD, that when the Missile Defense Agency reconfigured its budget last year, they, I guess they thought they were doing everybody a favor. They, they put everything into two major categories, national missile defense and theater missile defense, which sounds good, except when you start looking at those justifications, it's not always clear what belongs where because they have this one category that's sort of both, and it's impossible to disaggregate because the programs can, can account or go to both programs. So the best we can say is that at least $4.2 billion went to national missile defense and probably some significant portion of this $2.3 billion slice as well. Uh, next up is uh, nuclear threat reduction. Um, efforts to stem the spread of nuclear weapons and nuclear technology to eliminate loose nukes and prevent the use of nuclear weapons anywhere are a relatively low budgetary priority. Just 9.8 percent of the budget, 5.2 billion, was appropriated for such activities in 2008. Of that total, 60 percent went toward preventive and security measures, 20.7 percent focused on eliminating nuclear threats, actually getting rid of the materials or the weapons, and 19.3 percent was for nonproliferation programs. Now, some would argue that the U.S. nuclear arsenal itself prevents proliferation by providing a nuclear umbrella for U.S. allies who might otherwise acquire nuclear weapons. In fact, speaking at Carnegie uh, just over two months ago, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates said, quote, as long as others have nuclear weapons, we must maintain some level of these weapons ourselves to deter potential adversaries and to reassure our two dozen allies and partners who rely on our nuclear umbrella for their security, making it unnecessary for them to develop their own. So that's another perspective, and we do address that in the report. Next up is nuclear incident management. It's uh, considering the concerns raised by government officials and others in recent years, including uh, most notably the WMD uh, uh, Commission back in uh, December, uh, raised in recent years about the increasing likelihood that terrorists will use nuclear or radiological weapons on U.S. soil. It's striking that in 2008, only 1.3 percent of the nuclear security budget, slightly less than $700 million, was appropriated to prepare for the consequences of the use of such weapons. And this includes continuity of government programs, training expert teams to detect and defuse weapons, uh, developing methods to trace the original source of materials used in such weapons, and so forth. However, some relevant preparedness spending, particularly by the Defense Department and the Department of Health and Human Services, is not captured in this total. Uh, because it is uh, for disaster response generally and not nuclear attacks specifically. In addition, this report only assesses federal spending, not state and local funding for emergency preparedness and response, little if any of which would be directly tied to nuclear terrorism, but which nonetheless could be used to address it. And it's worth pointing out that historically, civil defense measures have received relatively little funding because officials did not want to undermine public confidence in nuclear deterrence because of the difficulties in protecting the entire population and because military leaders strongly and consistently favored offensive over defensive measures as the best allocation of resources. So what are our recommendations? Well, fundamentally, effective oversight of government nuclear security programs is impossible without complete, reliable data on their comprehensive annual and cumulative costs. And yet, such an accounting has never been available to decision makers, not ever, through the entire period that we've had nuclear weapons. We therefore make four key recommendations for policymakers to consider that would help rectify this fundamental problem and improve U.S. nuclear policy. The first is to create comprehensive nuclear accounting systems. Congress should require the executive branch to prepare and submit annually in conjunction with the annual budget request in both unclassified and classified forms an accounting of all nuclear weapons related spending for the previous fiscal year, the current fiscal year, and the coming fiscal year. The Defense Department using its future year's defense program should project nuclear weapons related spending five or six years into the future. A senior White House official, perhaps within the National Security Council or the yet to be created congressionally mandated office to coordinate nuclear proliferation and counterterrorism efforts should be responsible for overseeing this annual exercise in conjunction with key officials of the Office of Management and Budget and senior budget officials of key departments and agencies. And I would note that at her confirmation hearing yesterday, Senator Hillary Clinton, in response to written questions from the committee, uh, said that uh, the Obama administration would, quote, exercise uh, that they, they per, first of all, that this office would be created within the White House, the new office of uh, 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 
to coordinate nuclear proliferation and counterterrorism efforts. And the person in that office would be responsible for, quote, exercising budgetary authority over you, all U.S. programs related to nuclear security and biosecurity. So it seems like we're moving forward on that um, already. It's worth recalling that 10 years ago, the Commission to assess the organization of the federal government to combat the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and why they give these commissions names that you, you know, have to take two deep breaths to get out, uh, I don't know. But this was headed by former Director of Central Intelligence John Deutsch, who noted, quote, there is no system for tracking resource expenditures for combating proliferation. Doing so is, an, is essential to an effective interagency effort. Consequently, the report went on, and this is still true today. No one in the federal government knows how much money we are spending to combat proliferation. The success of any campaign depends on the resources available to wage it and, uh, and on the ways in which those resources are brought to bear. Currently, however, no one decides what level of resources should be devoted to proliferation-related efforts. There is no overall plan for how those resources should be allocated and no consistent evaluation of the effectiveness of these expenditures. The results of these efforts, these recommendations that we have made, should be used to produce an analysis for the next nuclear posture review, quantifying the cost of the nuclear status quo and the cost of potential savings of all of the alternative options considered by the administration. The costs associated with the Department of Energy's nuclear weapons production complex under these scenarios should be included as well. And once all of this is done, we would highly recommend that the Congress require the GAO to completely scrub the report to verify its completeness and accuracy and to improve the quality of future reports. Finally, accurate and timely financial data can be used by selected agencies, Congress, and non-governmental organizations to perform cost-benefit analyses on all nuclear security programs, including comparing the costs and benefits of proposed enhancements to the U.S. nuclear arsenal and the various threat reduction initiatives. For decades, decisions about the nuclear arsenal have been made based on assumptions of significant if often unquantifiable benefits uh, and with little or no reference to their cumulative long-term costs. Because those costs were poorly understood and never presented in a comprehensive manner to policymakers. With the decreasing emphasis on nuclear weapons today and in a time of fiscal austerity, it is now right more than ever, we would argue, to rectify this oversight. Recommendation number two is to quantify and explain nuclear security related intelligence expenditures. The Congressional Armed Services, Defense Appropriations and Intelligence Committees working with the intelligence community should devise tools to better explain and quantify nuclear weapons related intelligence expenditures. They should ascertain to the greatest extent possible how much is spent to enhance the effectiveness of operational nuclear forces, how much is spent supporting defensive operations related to weapons such as missile defense, uh, and how much is spent supporting efforts to prevent and eliminate nuclear threats and prepare and respond to nuclear incidents. Now, we would point out, and we do point out in the report, that this will be complicated, not just because this is all classified, but also because intelligence, many intelligence programs and platforms can perform multiple missions, sometimes simultaneously. A satellite in orbit could detect a missile launch, for example. It could also be used to verify an arms control agreement. It also could be used to track nuclear terrorists or to warn of a nuclear terrorism incident. Uh, whether and if it is possible to disaggregate among these categories is something that we leave up to the people that we're charging that with this responsibility. But we think it's a useful exercise if only to demonstrate internally how much money is being spent to, for example, make our nuclear weapons as useful as possible by making them as accurate as possible, and how much is being spent to make sure that loose nuclear material doesn't get smuggled out of Russia or Pakistan. Uh, and it may turn out that there are discrepancies there. We don't know because the numbers are classified, and I doubt anybody in the government knows exactly what the numbers are either. Greater insight and transparency about these matters, at the very least within policymaking circles, could enhance understanding of U.S. intelligence capabilities and lead to a better allocation of intelligence assets to address urgent nuclear-related threats. That's what I just said. Sorry, should have clicked on that. Recommendation number three, we're almost at the end, focus on proactive threat reduction strategies. Greater fiscal and programmatic emphasis should be placed on programs that seek to secure and prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons and the proliferation of technical knowledge and to eliminate the threats posed by such weapons, materials, and knowledge. 
Such programs, notably the Defense Department's Cooperative Threat Reduction Program and the Department of Energy's Materials Protection, Control, and Accounting Program, have a demonstrated record of success, are proactive, are more cost effective than technology driven efforts such as missile defenses, and can be implemented quickly and at a relatively, whoops, and at a relatively modest cost uh, and uh, uh, to ensure significant security gains today and in the future. These efforts currently receive funding sufficient for their limited scope. But increased funding, as we have recommended, will be required to implement President-elect Obama's pledge to, quote, lead a global effort to secure all nuclear weapons and material at vulnerable sites within four years. In a time of rising economic and fiscal concerns and increasing proliferation-related dangers, American taxpayers should demand and U.S. government leaders should ensure that the country is getting the most out of its limited nuclear security dollars. I will skip for the sake of time uh, establishing metrics for the proliferation security initiative, but we can come back to that later if you would like. And finally, ensure equity for atomic veterans. Very little is known about the cost of treating veterans who are exposed to dangerous levels of radiation while participating in atmospheric nuclear testing activities between the mid-1940s and the early 1960s, unlike programs created to compensate civilians injured by atmospheric nuclear weapons tests or workers at the DOE's nuclear weapons production facilities. Congress should require the Department of Veterans Affairs to provide a complete accounting of the nuclear, of the number of veterans past and present who are requesting and receiving compensation and care for injuries and illnesses attributable to exposure to radiation from U.S. nuclear weapons tests, including the cost of such compensation and care. Aggregated, cumulative, and annual figures for those whose claims have been denied should also be published to enable comparisons with the Radiation Exposure Compensation Program and the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. And I would just note that the only reason this isn't currently done is that the way the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs budget is structured, they only track expenditures by individual veterans, not by groups of veterans, uh, potentially for privacy reasons, potentially just because that's how they were set up. But they have no way of knowing. Um, given how large some of these other programs are, I think it's fair to say that we're probably talking about billions of dollars here, but it's an unknown cost because it's not quantified anywhere um, in the budget. It's frequently said that the Cold War was won without a shot being fired, and while it's true that the nuclear powers did not unleash their arsenals in anger, the reality is that nuclear weapons production and testing activities in the United States, and especially in the Soviet Union, and most likely in the others as well, injured and killed many of the very citizens who those weapons were said to be necessary to protect. Veterans, many of whom are now in their 70s and 80s, who were ordered or chose to participate in atmospheric nuclear weapons tests, which might be considered the front lines of the Cold War, and became sick as a consequence, deserve to know the collective cost of their sacrifice, as do their families and the rest of the country they swore to protect. Implementing all these recommendations will increase understanding and accountability, which in turn will lead to greater public support for critical nuclear security programs and a more effective allocation of public resources. When combined with the new focus on nuclear policy matters, including the administration's forthcoming nuclear posture review, such efforts will help to ensure that America's political and fiscal nuclear priorities are properly aligned. Uh, in the interest of time, I will skip reading all of this, but it's up there. Um, maybe I'll leave it up there for a second while Joe's talking. Unless, are you connecting to this? So, okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that's uh, an impressive and useful uh, presentation. And, uh, Stephen and his uh, co-conspirator, Adipti Chabe, have done us a great service uh, in doing this great research. Um, we're going to hear now from Joe Serencioni, who's the president of the Plowshares Fund. Uh, he also uh, has been nonproliferation uh, program director at Center for American Progress and the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, he did several stints on the Hill, where he's involved in defense reform efforts. He's the author of Bomb Scare, the History and Future of Nuclear Weapons, uh, which made me think, you know, are people worried about nuclear weapons now, and I thought back to Dr. Strangelove, um, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. And so I came up with a new subtitle for Joe's book, Why You Should Keep Worrying and Get Rid of the Bomb. Uh, and that may figure in his presentation, I don't know. But anyway, uh, we're going to hear from him now, and then we'll go to questions. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. You can close thank you very much, Bill, and thank you for the New America Foundation for allowing me to speak here today. And uh, thank you, Steve, for the tremendous study that you've done 
on this. You're absolutely right. We don't know how much all this is costing America. It is astonishing that the Congress, Republicans and Democrats, have not required this kind of basic accounting. So the Congress just doesn't know how much we're spending on these systems. I believe this is about to end. We are in the, the economic crisis of a lifetime. You keep hearing people say this. We haven't had a crisis like this in 75 years, and it could get worse. We have to start getting serious about our government spending. President-elect Barack Obama says he's going to go over the budget line by line. There's a lot of lines in Stephen's presentation. We have to make sure that those lines are included in this accounting, are included in this review, and that they're not somehow sealed off because they're, as the myth goes, vital to U.S. national security. Or the purview of a select elite who knows what to do with these systems. Stephen didn't even go into the corruption and the waste and the fraud that's involved in many of these programs. No IG has issued a report on these programs in years. When I was on the House Armed Services Committee, we did do some investigations on this, and we found massive waste, fraud, and abuse in the nuclear weapons programs. Um, it's time to start those investigations up again because we can no longer afford the luxury of spending, as Stephen says, at least $52 billion on nuclear weapons that we no longer need. By, uh, by my calculation, this, we're actually spending more than what Stephen has suggested. As he points out, this is a minimum. This is, we're spending at least $52 billion. I believe there are classified programs that we haven't included in this, in this total that have to be examined. I believe we have to include more in the missile defense category. I'll just give you one example. So my total ends up being about $56 billion, not including the, the, uh, the classified programs. Uh, Stephen has a uh, little over $9 billion for national missile defense. The folks at the Center for Defense Information counted at 13.2, so about a $4 billion difference. And that's because we count the programs that are not directly in the Missile Defense Agency, but are done by other agencies. Some of those you might want to do anyway. There's about, uh, oh, seven or eight hundred million dollars used for Patriot. But there's also one point seven billion dollars that the Air Force does for missile procurement that's directly related to the missile defense programs that could be cut. And there's a program called SIBRS, Space-Based Infrared Systems, that was started during the SDI days. I was on staff tracking this program that is a, a hugely expensive program. This year we're going to spend five hundred million dollars on this one satellite system, and that's just the cost for this year. It's a tens of billions of dollar program. Uh, it's being used to replace our existing early warning satellites, but because it's devoted to tracking and not just detecting missile launches, it's, it's much more expensive than a simple replacement system would be. So there's systems like that that you should cut. So I would include that in our missile defense count. So I would include missile defenses at $13.2 billion. And that's where I get some of the $4 billion difference I have with Stephen's figure. But that's okay. We can, this is still just the accounting. We can, we can you know, the experts can argue over this and we can perfect the accounting uh, numbers on this. The, the point is that there are substantial savings that can be found here. You'll notice that Stephen's recommendations were mainly on uh, sort of uh, accountability and accounting recommendations, requiring that this kind of tally be done for the Congress, requiring that we have a comprehensive uh, accounting of how much we're spending. I want to go further than that. I'm saying we can save money 
that we now desperately need by cutting the nuclear budget. In fact, that should be at the head of the queue. When you start looking at wasteful government programs that we can cut, nuclear weapons should be at the head of the queue. Yesterday, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator John Kerry from Massachusetts, had an op-ed in the Boston Globe where he recommended going down to 1,000 nuclear weapons total on the U.S. side, negotiating with the Russians to get them to go down to 1,000, we would go down to 1,000. Right now, we have 10,000 nuclear weapons. About 5,000 of those are in the operational stockpile. About 5,000 have been designated for dismantlement. We are reducing the number of nuclear weapons, but the idea is we're going to end up with something like a force of about 4,000 weapons, more or less. John Kerry saying go down to 1,000 weapons. If we were to do that, Experts at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment, Steve Koziak, estimate that we could save $20 billion. We could save $20 billion. So right off the top, whatever fig, 50, say we're spending about $52 billion, you cut down to 1,000 weapons, and, but, and when you got there, you could save about $20 billion. Is that figure exactly right? We don't really know because nobody's done the serious math to work. And maybe it's more than that. This requires not just eliminating the weapons, but we reconfiguring our force structure. The 1,000 nuclear warhead figure uh, would, would mean that we would give up the land-based systems, the ICBM, the bomber wing of the triad, and rely on 10 safe and secure Trident submarines patrolling the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, each one of which would have enough nuclear weapons to destroy any nation on Earth, two of which could destroy the entire planet. I think most Americans would feel safe and secure knowing we had that kind of nuclear force at our disposal, enough to meet any threat anywhere, anytime. And we could save money in the process. As we would reduce further, as many are calling for, we would reach additional savings. Warning. Talking about reducing nuclear weapons immediately hits a blowback from those who are vested in these programs, either financially or because of their careers, or because of the ideology. And the first thing you hear is, oh, no, 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 no. Just because you're cutting weapons doesn't mean you can save money, because you still need this infrastructure to support the force. Whether we have five weapons or 5,000, we still need all this infrastructure in the nuclear laboratory, in the, in the nuclear complex to support it. Nonsense. Nonsense. We need to have an independent evaluation of how we can downsize the nuclear weapons complex to achieve the kinds of real savings that we can get when we downsize the nuclear weapons force. I do not believe the estimates that come out or the arguments that come out, and most of them, they stand unanswered because most of us don't know how to answer them. We have to end that. We have to level the playing field. We have to bring in some independent green eye shades to take a look at these nuclear numbers. Number two, we have to end the practice of letting proponents of nuclear weapons act as if these weapons are free. You all have heard talk around town for years now about a reliable replacement warhead. Do you have any ideas a new warhead that would be created by the nuclear laboratories to replace many of the existing warheads we have? We have a set of perfectly good warheads. Warheads that could do a perfectly good job of destroying any city you would like. They are safe, they are reliable, they are accurate, but some people feel we need new ones that be a little safer, a little more accurate, a little more usable. How much does the reliable replacement warhead system cost? No one knows. They're not required to tell. They're not asked how much it would cost. They act as if it's free, that this is a vital national security system, and there's no cost to it. In fact, people have done some estimates about this. We're talking at a minimum $30 billion for this program. Oh, but that's just the beginning. 
because the real purpose of the reliable replacement warhead is not to make our warhead safer, secure, more reliable. It's to serve as a, to serve as a justification for an expansion of the nuclear weapons complex, the so-called Complex 2030 or Complex Transformation, where we would tear down some of the existing buildings, replace them with brand new, more modernized, more expensive buildings. This could cost about $200 billion. So this is what we have to do. We have to ensure that as we're discussing these nuclear policy options, there's a price tag attached to it. How much is this going to cost? We can't let people get away with, with, with diminishing the, the budget discussion by talking about, as they are recently, an organized crime library that some people want to put up in the economic stimulus bill. Make a joke about that or talk about the bridge to nowhere, make a joke about that. But somehow the nuclear weapons labs, the nuclear weapons complex, to get well, we can't talk about that because that's national security. We have to pay whatever it costs because that's national security. Who tells you that? Well, these scientists tell me this. These military guys tell me this. Nonsense. Let's put a price tag on their programs and hold them up and do what Obama says. Let's hold them up line by line. Let's evaluate them. And for the people who want to modernize the nuclear weapons production complex, who want to build new nuclear weapons, who want to build a new generation of missiles, a new generation of submarines, a new generation of bombers, how much? And what are you not going to do so that we can do this? What's the opportunity cost within the military and then within the overall budget? That's the kind of debate we have to have. That's the way we have to force this debate to be framed. I think we're beginning to see that. Because any talk about savings from nuclear weapons or getting accurate cost figures for nuclear weapons has to take place inside a new policy debate. This was the, you didn't hear about the cost of nuclear weapons for the last eight years. The administration didn't push it, the Congress didn't ask it. It was not at all framed that way. We are starting to see, and by starting I mean yesterday, we are starting to see a 180 degree turn in U.S. nuclear policy. It is happening. What candidate Barack Obama promised is now being implemented by the team he's assembled. If you didn't pay attention to Secretary-designate Hillary Clinton's testimony, you should have. Go back and look at the testimony. Don't go to the news accounts. Unfortunately, we're still caught in a media frame where they are country-focused or gaff-focused. So what are the headlines from the Hillary testimony yesterday? Donations to the Clinton Library Fund, number one. If you would search, that's the top issue that, that came up. Is this actually going to de- is this, is this an important issue? Yes, it is. Are there some some serious conflict of interest issues? Yes, there are. Is this going to derail her nomination? No, it's not. No, it's not. Is this going to fundamentally change U.S. national policy? No, it's not. What's the second? The second line that you get you, uh, what she said about Iran and what she said about the Middle East. So hot button issues, country specific. Where's the, what about the policy issues she talked about? She broke brand new ground on nuclear policy yesterday because she said things that previously had been campaign promises and she was now announcing them as government policy. And she phrased this, I think, exactly the way we all have to phrase this discussion. Some of us have been talking about this for a couple of years now. She promised that the Obama administration would do what they said they were going to do, that they were going to take head on the number one threat to America, which is the threat of nuclear terrorism. She called it our gravest threat and that they were going to secure and eliminate where possible all the loose nuclear weapons and loose nuclear material in global stockpiles and they're going to do it in the next four years. Wow. Wow. No one has ever said that. Clinton didn't do it. George H.W. Bush didn't do it. George W. Bush didn't do it. Clinton and Obama are saying they're going to do it. These are recommendations we've had from expert groups going back to the Cutler-Baker report of 2000. They're saying they're going to do it. So number one, bang, that is a big change. That's going to cost money. Not much money. 
estimated we'll go from about a billion dollars a year that we're spending on those kinds of programs to maybe three. We'll have a, a, a czar, a nuclear terrorism czar installed near the White House to do this, some organizational changes, but a big change. But then in her presentation, she pivots quickly from that nuclear threat to say, it's not while we're focused on this number one threat, we can't ignore the other dangers from nuclear weapons, wherever they are, whoever has them. And she talks immediately about what Secretary, what Senator Kerry wants to talk about, nuclear reductions with the Russians, engaging in negotiations with the Russians immediately on bringing the, the stockpiles down, and then bringing in the other nuclear armed countries on that. She talks, she ten, then says it's time to take our nuclear weapons off of hair trigger alert. Now we have had experts talking about this, I don't know, since I got in the field. I remember when, when, when Bruce Blair was a teenager, I think he was talking about this. You know, and now we have the Secretary of State designate saying this is what we're going to do. No, remember, no one has ever said this. No administration has ever said this. Now they're saying we're going to do this. That's a fundamental change. By the way, it saves us money. Because we have some of our best and brightest Air Force officers pulling three-day shifts in underground silos, wasting their time, being ready to launch Minutemen missiles on 15 minutes' notice. We have subs at very high alert level, wasting their time being ready to launch, many of them, their submarine launch ballistic missiles on 15 minutes' notice. You stand down that operational requirement, you start saving money right away. She also then talked about the, the, the bigger agenda on saying that the Obama administration was committed to ratifying the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, something that Sec Senator Kenneth Kerry also called for, and a whole list of other activities that have been on the to-do list but haven't been done, including negotiating a new treaty to end the production of any weapons material, uh, make, take, making every effort to shore up the nuclear nonproliferation treaty regime, in, engaging in intense consultations with their allies, a long list of issues. She basically went down the checklist and all the recommendations that people have been making for the last three, four years on this, she went, yes, we're going to do that, yes, we're going to do that, yes, we're going to do that. It is a 180 degree difference from what the administration has been doing on nuclear policy. And it's in that context that you can now have this discussion. You could have this discussion because we are, as the secretary designate for the Department of Energy said, committed yesterday at his testimony, committed to the long-term vision of a world free of nuclear weapons. That's where we want to go. So that's the vision. That's the policy paradigm that's now being set up. Which, which, within that, you now can't keep this just as policy. You've got to connect the money. You've got to go where the money is, and you've got to make sure you're turning off these programs one by one. Just as you shut your water pipes off in the winter so your pipes don't burst, we've got to shut these nuclear weapons program off so the, so the, so the budgets don't burst. This is the, the patriotic thing to do. We are going to re have resistance, number one, from the, the, the bureaucrats directly involved in this. They're not going to want to stop doing what they're doing. That's okay. That's what we pay them for. We, we give them a job, we turn them on, and when we go to turn them off, they resist. Understandable. There will be opposition from conservatives. Understandable. Some senators have, have based their careers on the importance of nuclear weapons and, and large numbers of nuclear weapons and using nuclear weapons. They're a minority. I think they're less than a quarter of the Senate, um, but we're going to have to deal with them. We're going to have to deal politely, cleverly w with them. The resistance I'm most concerned about, however, is neither of those. It's within the ranks of the administration. I believe that, what the, that, if, that we're going to have a struggle inside the Obama administration. If the Bush administration was characterized by a struggle between the pragmatists like Colin Powell and the neoconservatives who sold us on the war in, in, in Iraq, the new administration is going to see a struggle between the transformationalists who genuinely believe that we need a new transformed nuclear policy, a new national security paradigm, and the incrementalists. 
people who are happy to continue with more or less the policies of the past, whether they were being done by Bush or Clinton, but with some tweaks, with some accelerations, and are going to be willing to compromise on these issues in order to prove their defense bona fides. So they're not going to want to be seen as being anti-weapon or anti-military. And we have to help them understand that it's pro-military to cut weapons that our forces don't need, that most of the Joint Chiefs don't care about nuclear weapons, are happy to get rid of them. I believe you can turn the Air Force on this. Look at the problems the Air Force has had with nuclear weapons uh, over the last year. For the first time in U.S. history, the civilian and military head of a service, in this case the Air Force, were both fired, not over Abu Ghraib, not over strippers at Las Vegas, but over their failure to control nuclear weapons, over the basic problems. And why are they having these problems over nuclear weapons? Because they're not that important anymore, because people don't care about them anymore, because you don't get a career boost by dealing with nuclear weapons. These, it's ready to move these things into the storage bins of history. We can't quite throw them out yet, but we can move them on. And I think that you're going to have a lot of military men on your side, and that's why we have to help some of the, the new policymakers in the administration understand that you can be transformational and pro-military, transformational and pro-national security. In fact, this is a better national security, a better pro-military policy than just the go-it-alone strategy would, would indicate. I'll stop right there, so we have some time for questions. Thank you very much. I want to thank our speakers, and I'm proud to say that um, to the extent that they used acronyms, they spelled them out. Uh, I have a side hobby, which is called the Acronym Reform Movement, which is to eliminate acronyms, or if you have an acronym, it has to spell something. Uh, I, I don't want to go into that now because we need to get to questions, but uh, maybe we'll have a forum on that in the future. Uh, yes? Uh, Robert Gard, I'm with the Center for Arms Control and Non-Cooperation. Joe, the, uh, the internal debate in the new administration, Secretary Gates is on the record as saying the reliable replacement warhead RW is essential. What do you see, how do you see that playing out? Do you think he's going to stand his ground on that? Do you think he'll reverse himself? I mean, this could create a problem for President-elect Obama. It is. Uh, I, th this is one of the early discussions that uh, we'll have to have. I think, I think Bob Gates is a good man. I've met him on a number of occasions. I don't know if, uh, how you feel, but this is a smart, dedicated public servant, a great deal of integrity. And he signed on to a lot of, of the changes that we all want to see in national security strategy. He is a champion of strengthening the diplomatic arm of U.S. power. He understands that national security is multidimensional and has to include energy security and economic security. So he's on board with this expanded definition of, na of national security, and I think he's, he's definitely a, an asset to the Obama team. But there's going to be this problem. I think he's been, on this issue, he's been wooed by the dark side. I don't want to mention any names, but General Chilton. <laughs> who's well, the head of strategic command. We won't use his first name. <laughs> has, has, has won him over to this myth that somehow we need this. And here's how I would solve this. Let's solve it the way Secretary uh, Designate Clinton talked about this, about how a National Director of Intelligence Designate Denny Blair talked about it, Leon Panetta talked about it. Let's resolve this based on facts. Let's have facts and science resolve this issue. I believe if you put the, the, the reliable replacement warhead under the microscope, bring in independent scientific groups to evaluate the need for it, the, 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 the arguments for the program fall away. They are not sustained by the scientific arguments. They are not sustained by the military requirements. And that's the way I think you win Gates over. What do you think, General? Well, uh, Joe, I should mention that Dick Garwin, who many of you know, is a very distinguished nuclear scientist, 
has asked for an appointment of the Secretary of Gates precisely uh, to point out that the uh, uh, stockpile is perfectly safe as it is and to bring these facts to bear. So far, he's been unsuccessful in getting that. Yeah, I, I would encourage those kinds of meetings, but I honestly do think we need independent groups. I've been around town long enough to, to have seen this work in action. In, in 1987, the American Physical Society did a study of directed energy weapons. At that time, everyone thought the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, was going to be based on laser beams and particle beam weapons. And this was how we are going to shoot down 5,000 Soviet warheads streaming over the pole. The American Physical Society did a study and said, we won't even know about the feasibility of such systems for 20 years. That one study ended the debate. Bang. We stopped talking about direct energy weapons. We shifted over to kinetic energy weapons. The budgets for SDI went down. It faded away as a, as a major program. We need that kind of independent group to come in and evaluate the necessity for uh, replacing or repairing our existing stockpile of nuclear weapons. Uh, yes, in the back there. Yeah, hey, uh, ben Friedman, I'm from the Cato Institute. Uh, on the recommendation to go to a uh, submarine base, Perry, you'll be glad to know that uh, in our uh, K.O. Institute Policy Handbook chapter of the defense budget, which I wrote, we made the same recommendation. And what's the name of that book? It's the K.O. Institute Policy Handbook for uh, Congress. Want me to say it a couple more times? Thank you. It's <laughs> the, if you haven't heard, it's the Cato Institute <laughs> Policy Handbook for Congress. We made the same recommendation, and uh, so I was glad to hear you say it, of course. Uh, and uh, you mentioned briefly sort of the politics of getting there, but I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little more, either gentlemen. Because it seems to me, you know, really it doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell in the next eight years. You mentioned the Air Force might be for this. It seems to me they might be for it if you got, if, you, if we said you guys could keep the money for fighters, but they wouldn't be for it otherwise. So anyway, I'm just sort of yeah. curious about the yeah. politics of it. See, this is, what I'm, this is what I mean. We don't have enough money to do all this. I mean, right now, independent of what we've just been talking about, we have a huge budget crisis in procurement in the Department of Defense. You call it the procurement bow wave. The programs in the pipeline cost more than the projected budgets we're going to be afford, uh, can afford. Something's got to go. And that's based on more or less steady state defense budgets. I don't think you're going to get steady state defense budgets. Uh, we're going to have some increases in defense, but it's not going to be for weapon system. It's going to be for getting the troops out of Iraq, which cost in the short term. If we commit more troops to Afghanistan, that costs more in the short term. Something's got to give. I think something that those things are the future combat system for the Army. I think the F-22 is in real jeopardy. I think the new destroyer for the Navy is in, in real jeopardy. And so we have to get, we have to have a come to Jesus meeting with the Joint Chiefs to see what do, what do you really care about? You know, wh what are your priorities? Do you really think we need to maintain uh, Minuteman missiles on high alert? Do you really want the bomber force to have a nuclear component? And I think we can get a compromise fairly quickly on giving up one of those in the Air Force. Having them giving up both is going to be a longer and more difficult s struggle. But, that, but, but there are things that they care more about than, than that, uh, th those nuclear arms. And you're going to have to, in order to get the savings we're talking about, that's what you're going to have to do. You can't keep 10 missiles, 10 bombers. That does you know, keep you with some high operational costs that you otherwise wouldn't need. Uh, I just want to ask Stephen a question because he's here and he's got a lot to offer. Um, the, you had shown in your report uh, that about 10 percent of our uh, nuclear security budget that we know of goes to uh, cooperative threat reduction efforts to lock down secure uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear materials. Um, but you also mentioned that we're kind of where the market will bear under current, pol current policies. What do you think would need to change to usefully invest more in that uh, activity? Uh, well, CTR, by the way, is only about a billion dollars out of, out, of uh, out of that five point whatever billion dollar slice. So That's why there's I a lot asked. going in there. <laughs> um, I guess what needs to change is what needs to change on everything else, which is just a fun fundamental reassessment of what our objectives are, you know, as, as Secretary Gates said, as I quoted him, you know, for him, nuclear security is having a nuclear arsenal that helps keep us safe and keeps our allies from wanting to get nuclear weapons of our own. I think those are both debatable points, but it's 
it's a valid perspective and one that you know he and obviously a great many other people share. Uh, I would argue, although, and again, we don't make recommendations in the report like this, so I'm, this is a personal perspective, that you're going to get more bang for the buck or more unbang for the buck, if you will, through things like CTR and the DOE's Materials Protection Control and Accounting Program because you're dealing with the threat on the ground at the source before it becomes a significant issue, before it gets stolen or diverted, before it gets put on top of a missile that's fired at you, and then you've got to turn on your missile defense system for the first time and hope that it works perfectly when you can never really test it, you know, in, in under real world conditions. Um, I'm not I'm not prepared to say at this point that missile defense, all missile defense is a bad idea. I think that would be you know, an overstatement. But the way that we've approached missile defense over the last eight years or the last, you know, eight to let's say eight to twelve years, uh, I think has put, you know, the cart before the horse in a very um, fiscally ineffective and, you know, other ways, ineffective ways. So it just, you know, people have to say, well, what is our objective here? So if our objective is to prevent the use of nuclear weapons against us, I think there are far more effective ways to do that. And you can do it at far less cost than, than focusing on missile defense. And I think hopefully our data will begin to allow people to make that argument more um, effectively. It's not a new argument, but having the numbers to back it up, I think, helps. And since you've given me the microphone, I just would be remiss if I didn't Thank Joe because Plowshares is one of the funders of this project. So thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, the gentleman in the front. Uh, Ira Shore, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Building out from the ROW question to the complex transformation question and the cost of that, which is, you know, as you're saying, there's no, it hasn't been quantified or nothing specific as yet. How do you think the movement, you know, as Kerry calling for a thousand and the administration moving in that direction? impacts uh, the complex transformation pathway? Does, does that take it down? And, you know, connected to that, where do you think the nuclear posture review conclusions, uh, well, the impact of that, and, you know, yeah. with this administration, will we come out with something different than we did with the Clinton administration because there's new thinking? Yes. Uh, two things. Logically, the commitment to, to reduce steadily to lower numbers of nuclear weapons should reduce the costs of your nuclear weapons complex. Politically, however, it may not. Uh, my colleague Terry Lodge is here in the audience, and she and I have talked to many um, Hill staffers who make the argument that in order to reduce, we need a new warhead. So, you know, it's like, what, whatever, whatever the issue, I will adapt my program to fit that issue. You want to reduce? You need my warhead to reduce. And un slightly underneath that is, if you don't give me my warhead, I'm not going to give you your reductions. So there's a real power politic play here backed up by the muscle of some of the nuclear laboratories and some of the, of the military command, although not the majority of either. I think we have to defeat that argument. I think we have to be nice to people, we reason with people, but we need an independent arbitration here. We need a scientific assessment of what do you really need and take it away from this deal. I find all over town people who don't know jack about nuclear warheads are ready to make a deal trading a new nuclear warhead for reductions. And by the way, people who don't know jack about nuclear warheads are opposing a deal of a new nuclear warhead for reductions. We got to get smart on the science here, all of us together. What do we really need to do to ensure that we have a safe, secure, and reliable warhead? We have to learn more the science and technology of this in order to make a, a decision as, as a nation to get the kind of convergence that Barack Obama uh, wants. That was the first part of your question. What was the second one? The posture review and where it... Uh, There's no question that, 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 that you cannot make a decision on a new nuclear warhead or an expansion of the nuclear weapons complex until you have a posture review that tells you what you're doing for the future of your force. Why do we have nuclear weapons? What are the missions? What's the force requirements to accomplish these these missions. You cannot be making significant budget allocations until you have the answers to that. So there should be no budget allocations on either uh, development of new warheads or design or construction of new 
uh, uh, Department of, D of Energy weapons production facilities until after the NPR is done. So that means we're not going to, we shouldn't be, these, we shouldn't see any of these until the FY11, uh, fiscal year FY11 budget. Yes, Stephen. Did I say that right, Terry? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to add to that. Um, there was an interesting response from the National Nuclear Security Administration yesterday to our report published in Global Security Newswire. For those of you that didn't see it, it's short. Let's just let me read it to you. Uh, this is from spokesman John Brome. Um, he, he told uh, reporter Elaine Grossman that the $6.6 .6 billion that the DOE spends on maintaining nuclear weapons was a good deal for the taxpayer. He said the investment not only helps ensure the arsenals and viability, but also contributes to the agency's nonproliferation and nuclear incident response capabilities. Quote, our nonproliferation work and emergency response work would not be possible without the nuclear weapons program. We rely on weapons program expertise and infrastructure for this work. So they're coming up with yet another argument there. Um, I would, I totally agree with everything that Joe said. I would just add that um, we should be clear that while there are certainly savings available if we uh, shut down or significantly downsize the size of the complex, there are also costs associated with that in terms of decommissioning those facilities, and they are not insignificant. We're talking about many tens of billions of dollars over several decades at the very least. So uh, while I personally would be in favor of, of reductions, I think we need to be clear that, you know, reducing it, first of all, getting those reductions in force is there's a cost associated with that. It's reducing the number of weapons in the arsenal it's a lot less expensive than decommissioning facilities, but there's a cost associated with that. It's one time, and then it goes away, and then your lifetime savings are, are there. Uh, but the cost of these facilities is quite substantial uh, because they have never been, well, they were never taken care of properly during the Cold War. So we need to bear that in mind and make sure that we are adequately funding that mission at the same time as we build down the force. So there's no time to waste. And there's no waste to, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Yes, uh, the woman at the end there. Yes. Hi, I'm Chris Needham, and I'm here from Utah. Uh, we've got a new group, Utah Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And my big question is about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And initially, we thought this might come up in the 111th Congress. Now I'm wondering, Joe, if you have any updated information about when we can expect this to really come up and look at ratification. We've got a couple. I think it's very likely to come up in the 111th Congress. I don't know if it'll be uh, by the end of this year or early next year, but I think that's the time frame most, most of us are, are looking at. And if it doesn't, if it slips, it may slip permanently. So, you know, there is a sweet spot for getting treaties, and we're in one now, so we have to take advantage of it. Uh, things to look for in when Sec Secretary designate uh, Hillary Clinton was running for president, she wrote an article in Foreign Affairs pledging to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in 2009, the 10-year anniversary of the Senate's failure to ratify it. Uh, you heard a very strong endorsement from her yesterday on the CTBT, both in spoken testimony, written testimony, and the questions for the answer. Senator Kerry, in his Boston Globe op-ed, made this his number two priority. He had only two. One, reduced to 1,000 warheads. Second, ratify the CTBT Treaty. Next, foreign leaders who will be meeting with the President. This is at the top of their list. I mean, Gordon Brown, Prime Minister of the UK, President Sarkozy from, from France. This is at the top of their list. When you go around the world and ask foreign officials what's the one thing the U.S. can do to show off the nonproliferation treaty, they say ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I think you will very soon see the beginning of a bipartisan effort to, um, to, to, to work this issue in the Congress and to win over key Republican senators so we can get the six or seven votes we need to ratify it. We're very close. One tactic we're working on, we understand that Representative Tauscher from California is going to reintroduce her House resolution urging ratification, so we're also after our uh, Representative Mathis and to co-sign that, and I don't know if there are other groups here that could also, again, that's in the House, but again, to try to put some bipartisan I think all the House efforts are great, of course, it is the House and it's the Senate that ratifies. <laughs> but talk to that young lady behind you, Terry Lodge, afterwards. 
so we're getting, we're below 10 minutes. We have to end promptly because uh, Zalmay Khalilzad is speaking here at 1215, which should be interesting in its own right. Uh, so if you want to spend your whole day here, feel free to stay. Um, uh, yes, the gentleman in the red tie. Can you identify yourself? Oh, sorry, uh, Greg Mello, Los Alamos Study Group. Um, we, uh, while we are talking about larger policy questions, the weapons complex is investing in its modernization. And it, for example, at Los Alamos, um, there's a approximately $2.6 billion plutonium facility, uh, which is being funded every year. Every, for five years, the House has tried to kill that. And that is the place where the RRW would be made. Without that building, they, there's no RRW. And um, it's, not, uh, it's not strictly a local issue. And this goes in, this is, relates to Steve's talk where he said we had an average of 4.7 billion um, in the Cold War for research, development, testing, and production. And now we have this larger number, 6.6. And it's a very curious uh, phenomenon. There's enormous waste at the weapons laboratories. And this, as you know, is of course where the primary home of, or a primary home of the ideology that, that uh, is sort of the, uh, uh, like the reservoir of infection, you might say. And, uh, and for those who spend a lot of time around the laboratories, there's, you know, they're very expensive places. And more people there now, their nuclear weapons budgets are enormous compared to what they were during the Cold War. And um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities there, and I, I couldn't agree with you more um, about the need for um, putting that right into the uh, budget uh, hawk domain. Um, there's a big opportunity there yeah. that will help with the CTV team. Can I ask you a question about this? This Please. is real quick. One of my theories, and it's just a theory, is that what we have to do is replace the revenue and career stream for the new national laboratories that we now have, as the head of Department of Energy, or soon will have, a Nobel laureate, I think that's the first time any cabinet member has been a Nobel Prize winner, who wants to transform our nuclear laboratories. Now, I haven't heard him elaborate what this is, but I believe we should be able to put a new, new missions into the nuclear laboratories on clean energy, for example, on alternative fuel sources that can provide a, a new energy, a new revenue stream and new career paths. It isn't like the people who are working on nuclear can just jump over and work on this, but it gives a new mission for some of these previously solely nuclear laboratories and can wean them away from the importance of the, of the nuclear stream. What do you think of that? Um, we should talk more, but briefly, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Next question. <laughs> uh, Sandia is the easiest to do that. Uh, Livermore next. Los Alamos worst. Yes. Um, they're very expensive. The quality of science has dropped tremendously, especially at Los Alamos. If those missions are important, you would not want to send them there because they have <laughs> tremendous management problems and tremendous overhead problems, which they are very important. And they also turn every good thing into a GNAP or a um, they're very, um, very uh, bottom line oriented and ideologically oriented. So it would be easier to do those new missions in a brand new institution or in universities or in other labs. And they will hide behind the legitimacy of these new missions and greenwash their nuclear weapons missions and use it as a turtle shell to go through a difficult time in the Obama administration and then reemerge, perhaps, as they did Whoa. in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, they want those missions to greenwash themselves, and the newspaper reporters and everything are poised to jump on those things when, even if it's only 5% or 1%, those are where the newspaper articles are, and everyone in around thinks that's what they do. They don't realize there's 70, 80 percent nuclear weapons still. Thank you. Uh, GNAP would be the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. Is that correct? I just want to Yo, spell yeah, sorry, yeah. under my yeah. practice of spelling out acronyms. I just wanted to. Uh, all right, so we're really down to the wire here. Um, yes, the gentleman here, and then right here. Maybe questions back to back, and then we'll answer them. Oh, so you, you first. Yes. I'm Carl Lundgren from Jonas Feeds. Uh, I'm going to ask a kind of economic question, and I don't know if this is where your the next version of your study might be going, but the budgetary numbers are what the government pays, and economists also look at what happens to the broader society. And one aspect is if workers are injured or killed because of atomic uh, testing, um, 
economists would usually have those costs higher than what the government might be paying to compensate victims. That's just maybe a minor issue in this context, but it is important. Uh, the other issue would be you're only taking a snapshot of one year, fiscal year 2008, and ideally we'd like to know what these programs cost over a stream of time. So, mm. so we could say sensible things like how much does a missile cost or uh, how much does a bomber program cost and how much does it cost if we vary the size of the program and, and that sort of thing. And I don't know if that's where you plan to take this or not. Uh, yeah, and quickly, if you want to. I'm Diane Perlman, psychologist for Social Responsibility Initiative on Global Violence, Terrorism, and Nuclear Disarmament. Um, you mentioned that Gates um, said that we need, as long as other countries have nuclear weapons, that we need them to deter. And um, Joe, you also mentioned that um, the reasons, you know, their best interests were like economic, ideological, and career, but there's also false beliefs about why we need them, or the books said to, to, to be deterred to them all that stuff and they're all very flawed and other countries you know, think well as long as we have nuclear weapons that they need to build theirs so it has actually the opposite effect I, I call that nuclear narcissism and that actually a lot of things that we do I think I'd like to know if you agree that a lot of things that we do to um, prevent proliferation provoke prolifer the desire um, so maybe one of the messages would be some in, in addition to holding up the cost some like don't be a sucker some, some variation of that. So, uh, so if, um, if we'll give our panelists a uh, brief uh, uh, opportunity yeah. to respond, and then um, you can talk to us afterwards until they kick us out so they can change the chairs around. Well, I'll take the questions in the order that they were asked. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more that we need to have uh, this done on an annual basis. When we finished Atomic Audit back in 1998, our fundamental recommendation was the very first one that I gave you here today. Do this on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Congress should mandate it. Didn't happen because Congress was impeach, uh, busy with a little thing called impeachment and had a few other things on its mind and really dropped the ball, unfortunately. Um, so we have another opportunity to do that now. Uh, and I think we've laid out the way that that can happen. I don't have plans for Another study, if, if plowshares and the other funders of this work want to, uh, you know, provide some money and I've got the time, uh, yeah, I guess. How many people think we should fund this contestant? <laughs> <laughs> it's a choice of this or the Clinton Presidential Library. As I have said, we are really not very expensive relative to everything that's in here and a lot of other things that you can see, honestly, you know. I am, I am pretty cheap, yes, I am pretty cheap. I don't want to sell myself. you got it on you, Jeff? <laughs> Let's do a collection, yeah. There. But uh, seriously, um, I, I, as I said in other forums, I'm happy to do that, but quite frankly, this is the government's responsibility. So, uh, and if it were done on an annual basis, within a few years, you'd be able to see these things track. Now, to, to correct something that you said, the cost of missiles, the cost of bombers, even the cost of these programs at DOE, they are known. Now, the, cost, the DOE stuff, the DOE budget is public, except for the intelligence budget. Everything is in there. It's, you know, it's all available on the internet. I can't tell you how much easier it was to do this than when we did atomic audit in the mid-90s because I didn't have a room full of books, you know. So, I mean, it's really, anybody can do this. It just takes time. Um, the DOD side is more complicated because, as I said, the Futures Defense Program uh, database, which is where all this program level data is, that's, it's not exactly classified, but it's not publicly available. Um, there are other ways that you can get some of that information out. And, but it is, I, I would not want anybody to leave the room, least of all you thinking that you couldn't know what a missile or a bomber program costs, because you definitely do. You know, there may be disputes about the quality of the data, but it's definitely there, and the Government Accountability Office, Congressional Budget Office, and elsewhere can check it. Uh, in terms of, uh, just real quick, because I know Joe wants to answer your question too, um, I think it is important to keep in mind that, that actions do have consequences. And, you know, it's again, it's not something that's in the report, but I would just say, you know, the missile defense program itself, portrayed by its ad, as, as its advocates as a way of preventing missile proliferation, uh, or at least protecting us if it happens, could in fact accelerate miss missile proliferation and and poison our relations with Russia, as we're already seeing. And there are definitely uh, tangible and intangible costs associated with that that have to be borne in mind. Uh, I agree with all that, and let's talk about a follow-on project. And uh, Diane, abs absolutely. In fact, there's some very interesting um, uh, phrasing 
In the interim report by the U.S. Strategic Commission, which is a, a mixed bag of a report, but one of the phrases in that is where the commissioners say, what we do in our nuclear weapons labs matters to others. What we, how we deploy our weapons matters. The choices we're making matters. And there's a recognition that the posture decisions that we make, that the nuclear weapons production decisions we make, influence other countries' decisions on whether they should go down that nuclear weapons road or not. You know, for many of us, well, this is, well, duh, of course, but there is an active debate in the strategic community about whether our arsenal actually influences other countries' uh, nuclear weapons decisions. I think, of course, it does. Of course, it does. So uh, the only thing I would say is that our project, the Arms and Security Initiative, is going to be doing more work on the uh, interim and long-term costs of complex transformation. Maybe we'll have a dialogue with the National Nuclear Security Administration about that if they were willing to join us here. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And we're here briefly if you want to, uh, you know, say hi or have a brief question. And um, let's do something like this again. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I,